Good morning. Today is the 8th of Av and the 26th of July. Uh, 8th of Av is the... Is the... Uh, you can't hear me? Oh, I muted myself. The 8th of Av is the day just before Tisha B'Av, the uh, day on which the, both temples were des destroyed close to both temples. Uh, there's a little bit of a discrepancy, but in principle it's uh, the 9th of uh, Av was uh, the day in which both of them were burning. And uh, in the second temple, it usually says that uh, the, the fire started actually uh, at the very end of the 9th of Av. And it burnt, most of the burning was burning, or whatever they could burn. <laughs> it almost sounds like it's a, it's a wooden shack. Is it made out of such bricks and, and uh, such huge stones that really, I don't know, you know exactly what burnt, um, but uh, that lasted into the tenth of Av. Um, something very important to know about the Temple Mount today is that uh, nobody today has the ability, even, even today we don't have the ability to, uh, to demolish the foundation upon which the Temple stood. It's such a huge foundation. Um, we were there this summer and uh, went into the the, uh, uh, the tunnels underneath the uh, Muslim quarter where you can see the size of these uh, stones and the thickness, which is about uh, uh, sometimes uh, over over uh, two meters thick. These stones can't be moved. The Romans couldn't move them. Nobody could move them. They they're there. <laughs> the whole foundation is there. The only thing that's missing is the building on top. Um, but the build, but the foundation is actually much much greater than the building in terms of its size, in terms of the uh, uh, project that that uh, was required to uh, create it. In any case, we want to put all of this in perspective to today's reading, the fourth reading of Vayetchanan. And today is the day that uh, in our parsha we read the Ten Commandments a second time. We've mentioned many times this uh, idea of 88 extra letters. I was debating about whether to explain this more in depth today, but <coughs> then decided against it because it, it would be a lot of a lot of mysticism, a lot of Kabbalah, and uh, so I deferred that maybe to some other time, some other opportunity. Instead, I'd like to focus on the timeline again. On the 17th of Tammuz, Mo Moses uh, uh, came down the first time from the mountain and he broke the first set of tablets. The tablets on which the Ten Commandments, which we now know are not commandments, but ten sayings, uh, which include maybe ten, uh, 13 or 14 commandments. Uh, so the tablets were very um, unequal because if you look at the, f the, because they had five commandments on one and five on the other, and if you look at the number of letters, it's very uneven. It's not balanced. So almost 90% of the letters were actually on the right uh, tablet and another 10% on the left tablet because the last five sayings are actually very short. The shape of the tablets is not what people think and it's not the way that Christian um, uh, art usually depicted them, because you hear the word tablet, so you think, um, well, this looks something like well, a tablet. <laughs> but that's not the shape. The shape was actually a cube. Each one of the tablets was a six by six by six cube, and this is something that we didn't, we didn't get a chance to talk about, but this whole idea of that we talked uh, a few days ago about Moses being uh, reincarnated in every generation is related to this number 216. 6 by 6 by 6 is equal to 216. Um, it's equal to many things in uh, Torah. The most important one, of course, which is uh, Gvura or Yira. Gvura and Yira, might and fear or awe are equal to the same uh, number 216. It's also equal to three times 72, three times loving kindness, chesed. There's a lot to go into it, but the, the important thing is that these were cubes. Um, not unlike, in some ways, the tefillin that we put on, that are also cubic in their shape. 
And there's probably a connection. I haven't seen anybody write about it, or it doesn't mean that there isn't. But in my mind, they right away they are connected one to another. And the amazing thing about them was that you could see the letters from any direction that you looked, meaning from all six directions you could see the, let the same letters. Uh, the letters were, in that sense, from side to side, going from side to side. There's a lot, di a lot of discussion about that. So Moses broke the first set of tablets on the 17th of Tammuz. And then he immediately, the next day, he went up again for another 40 days and 40 nights. And it's very interesting that the, they ha the people had a problem with his being late six hours. Uh, another reference to the six by six by six. But they, they had a problem with him being late six hours. And then the, he disappeared pretty much for 40 days and 40 nights. He didn't say what he was doing. He went up, of course, to pray to God to forgive the people for the uh, making of the golden calf. But there, nobody says anything. It's almost like it's, it's accepted that this is what's going on. Then he came down again, <coughs> and he went up a third time on the first of Elul, the first day of the month of Elul. And he was there for another 40 days, and he came down on the 10th of Tishrei, and that is Yom Kippur. He came down with the second set of tablets. And we said the second ta set of tablets had different writing than the first set. The first set had the Ten Commandments as they are written in, in Jethro, in the book of Exodus, and the second set of tablets that he brought down on Yom Kippur, on the 10th of Tishrei, there was no Yom Kippur yet, but it was the 10th of Tishrei, they had the, te the commandments, or the, the Ten Sayings, as they are in our Parsha, in Parashat Vaitchanan, in today's reading with the 708 letters that it has. What is, wh what is this all about? If you've been following uh, my channel um, with the series that we're doing in Morning Hasidus, uh, the series of what is exile and, what, and that exile is not what you think it is, it's not a punishment and so on, you have to understand that this is a very, uh, best way to say it is a modern uh, interpretation of exile because Certainly, a thousand years ago, nobody would have said that exile is not a punishment. That's exactly how everybody thought about it. However, the Zohar already tells us that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the author of the Zohar, or the, or the, or the main uh, 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 sage whose teachings are in the Zohar, by him there was no destruction. That's how it describes it. And the understanding is that he wasn't living in a state of exile. He was living in a state of the temple being built somehow, even though he was born after the temple was destroyed. And so this ties in to what we've been learning in the morning, that the exile is not, at least the way we need to understand it today, is no longer a punishment. It hasn't been a punishment for a long time. What it is, is a state of concealment that precedes a tremendous revelation. And the parable that we've been looking at is a teacher who in the middle of his uh, class has a tremendously new insight and he knows that if he doesn't stop the class to think about this insight and think it out, he'll lose it. He won't remember it later. So he stops the class and he goes and eventually he even maybe even leaves the room and he disappears for a while thinking about how he's going to present this new insight to his uh, beloved students. And then he comes back and the first sign is that they see that his face is shining, that he's, he's, he's just beyond himself with joy over this new insight that he's received. The same is true about what happened uh, during the in middle 40 days that Moses was gone. The middle 40 days that Moses was gone, it was like complete concealment. They didn't know what the situation was. They knew Moses had gone up again to the mountain, they understood that it was to beg for forgiveness, but they didn't know what the, what the result would be. But that was, could be understood at least at some level, as a trying to, as, as an attempt to uh, cancel the punishment that was supposed to come. So that could be understood as exile, as punishment still. But the third set of 40 days, when Moses came down with the second set of tablets, that was completely mysterious. 
okay, God said he forgives. And that happened after the, first set of, uh, the second set of 40 days. Why go up ag again? And what the Kabbalists and what the Hasidists understands from this is that the goal of this concealment, even the goal of the destruction, even the goal of the sin of the golden calf and so on and so forth, was actually to rise, to ascend to a new level of revelation of God that could not be understood before. And especially in our exile, where the punishment was lo is long gone, it's, 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 it hasn't been in the world for maybe 1800 years already. What we're going through is a long process of this new insight being, we'll call it, coming down into the world and eventually being revealed. So those 40 days and 40 nights that Moses was up on the mountain the second time, and then he brought down the second set of tablets, sorry, the third time, and he brought down the second set of tablets, that is like the exile that is a preparation for a new revelation. And the new revelation was these second set of tablets. Now how are they different than the first set of tablets? We've already said about the number of letters, but we have to say something a little bit more concrete uh, to wrap our heads around. The first set of tablets assumed that there was no sin in the world. When they received the first set of tablets, they had been healed from even the sin of Adam, meaning that there was no longer death in the world. And that we call that the Torah of the Tzaddikim, the Torah of the pious. But the second set of tablets was a greater revelation because it could come down to even people who do have sin, who do transgress and are not perfect. And after they worshiped the golden calf, death came back down into the world. So we actually, we don't suffer anymore from the snake, we suffer from the calf. And I think we talked about this uh, at some point, uh, this interesting imagery, that our problem is today with the uh, calf, and that's why we have the, the red heifer, and so on, which cancels death, and so on. But the more important part of the second revelation, the second uh, set of tablets that we read about in today's uh, reading, is that it not only says that um, the Torah can come down to those who have sin, but much more than that. And in our generation, what it means is, and when we read it, this is the way we need to read it, is that the Torah is revealing something that is not necessarily a change in action because what the first set of tablets said and what the second set of the tablets said is basically the same. It's a revelation of more knowledge. It's an, it's an increased revelation of godliness. And this is a great principle of the Baal Shem Tov that repentance, which we call tshuva, return to God in our generations is not only about changing one's actions it's first and foremost about changing one's consciousness one's attitude one's knowledge and that is a cornerstone of the Baal Shem Tov's thought and something that we talked about yesterday about Torah being a safe haven being a city of refuge but it's not just to save me from the past, it's to open the, the, the future. And there's a famous story about this that the Baal Shem Tov uh, once told. He, in general, didn't like using reincarnations to uh, motivate people to change. So he didn't usually talk about reincarnations, but, but about his own he did. And he said that in a past life he was Rav Saad Yagon. I don't remember if I told you the story already or not. Rav Saad Yagon was probably the most important Jewish figure in the 10th century. And he's a, I recommend just reading about him. The story in short is that he was uh, uh, staying by someone who didn't recognize him, who didn't know him because there were no pictures then. Nobody could know who, was, who somebody was. Very wealthy man, but he was stay, staying there as a guest and the man didn't know it was him. And after three days he left and he said goodbye to the man. The man never asked him what his name was. And he went, he went on, he continued on. You have to understand, this was like the king of the Jews in the, in the 10th century. So he leaves, 
and a few minutes later this man or not a few minutes a half an hour an hour later he's speaking to a friend of his and the friend asks him so how was it having Rav Sadia Gaon in your house he said I haven't had Rav Sadia Gaon over he says of course you have he was staying with you he was here for three days we know he was staying with you so he inquired with the servants and he said yes of course he even said goodbye and then he realized that he didn't re he didn't recognize him he didn't know who he was and he was so embarrassed so he got on his fastest horse and he ran and he, and he galloped after him until he uh, reached his, uh, his carriage. And he stopped him and Rav Sadiagon was worried. He thought something had happened in the man's house and he was calling him back. So he gets off, he, he, he comes to the, he gets off the carriage and this man gets off his horse and he bows down to him and he's crying. He says, why are you crying? What happened? He says, I'm so sorry, I didn't realize it was you. So he says, how was that important? He says, no, no, you don't understand. I didn't realize I was hosting Rav Saadi Gaon. So Rav Saadi looks at him and says, but everything was fine. Everything was wonderful. There was nothing more you could do. So he says, you don't understand. If I would have known it was you, I would have hosted you a million times better, with a million times more honor. And so Rav Saadi Gaon bid him farewell, and he said, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. And he left. And then he told the story and he said, that day I understood what the Talmud means when it says that a person can do tshuva every day, that the person returned to God every day. How can that be? He says, it's not about rectifying our misconduct. It's about opening our consciousness. It's about understanding that yesterday I didn't yet understand who God was. If I would have understood who God was yesterday, I would have served Him completely differently than I did. And today that I've learned more, today that I've learned more Torah, that I understand more, God is entirely different. Today, even if I haven't learned Torah, just the very fact that I'm alive, I've seen, I've seen more of the world, I've seen more of what's going on, I understand, I appreciate how great God is much more than I did yesterday. And so that is the type of rectification, that is the type of tshuva, of return to God, that is more necessary in our generations than in past generations, because the revelation, the difference between the first tablets and the second tablets is an additional 88 letters. It's not more strict, it's not less strict, it's not adding more commandments or taking off any commandments, it's revealing more of God. And just one of the small things that comes from these 88 letters we said already once that it is the the 88 is the value of of a, of a stream and in parashat akev we won't see it already but you'll see it if you read there is a verse that moses describes and it says <clears throat> that there was a stream coming down the mountain down mount sinai but more importantly than that one of the 13 measures of principle actually two of them is notzer chesed lalafim he keeps his loving kindness for thousands of generations. Those uh, three words, Notzer Chesed Alafim, their initials equal 88. They also are the initials are Nachal, stream, the same same word. And so this is the idea that these 88 words they contain a stream that goes through thousands of generations. In other words, that it is a meeting meeting God in more and more infinite revelation from generation to generation through a thousand generations, each generation revealing more and more of what God is. So with these, these thoughts in mind, um, we should go into Tisha B'Av, understanding that even though we're mourning the destruction of the Temple, at the same time Tisha B'Av is considered to be a Yom Tov, it's considered to be a holiday. It's just a holiday that has not yet surfaced. It hasn't been revealed yet. In that sense, it's the same thing. It needs to be revealed, the greatness of this day, the, the world is, as, as it were, it's not yet completely ready for this revelation. But that's what we really pray for on this day, that we're mourning the end, the end of the past. That's true. But we're also looking with our eyes forward for the revelation of the future. And the revelation of the future will be like the second tablets. It will be a revelation of Notzel Chesed Lalafim, of this great loving kindness that God keeps for thousands of generations. So thank you very much for joining.